Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Very happy to be here with you and to be able to speak from the book of Matthew and the parable of the sower. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Gabizon. I am a PhD student at McMaster University, where I'm uh, studying religious studies, Second Temple Judaism. Uh, and McMaster is located in Hamilton, Ontario, and that is where I currently reside with, uh, with my family, my wife and my three children. Uh, however, in about a month's time, we're going to be moving permanently to Montreal to be here alongside with you. So we're very excited. People uh, often ask me if I had finished my degree by that point, and no, I will still be writing it long distance for about another one or two years, but we wanted to be closer with, uh, with you guys. We had the opportunity, so we're very excited for it. Now, I've been in school for a uh, many number of years. I like to tell people I'm going into grade 26. Um, and throughout that time, I've been to quite a few different religious institutions. And without fail, one of the central questions that's often asked at a religious institution where you're training to study the word and to proclaim it is, why do people leave the faith? Why do people turn away and leave their church or leave their messianic communities? Now, maybe you know somebody who you perceive to have a very strong faith. Maybe this person was a type of role model for you, and you looked up to them, and then later they turned away. Or maybe you yourself have found yourself struggling with understanding the scripture, struggling with being excited about it, and wondering what the point is of even reading any of it. These are not uncommon stories. When I was 17 years old, before I left Montreal, I was doing uh, Bible studies here at Beth Ariel for the, uh, for the youth. And there was somebody who I worked closely with, and we sang songs together, and we went to the conferences together, we went to studies together, and they encouraged me in my faith. They were what I perceived to be a strong believer. However, when I went off to Chicago to study, that person, I later found out, completely abandoned the faith. So how does that happen? What actually happens to bring us to that point? Now, when faced with these situations of people leaving their faith, numerous solutions are often proposed, right? On the one hand, people say we need better apologetics. We need people to be able to defend their faith against critiques. Or others say we need more application in sermons. We need people to feel like they're getting something out of coming to congregation. Or we need people to get more involved or something along those lines. Now, all of those things are great, and I, I've benefited from them, and I'm sure you have as well. However, I think the solution is a lot more simple. It all comes down to your heart condition and my heart condition. Are we cultivating our spiritual lives? Because if we're not advancing, then we're regressing. When you look at giants of the faith like Paul, or you look at A.W. Tozer or Charles Spurgeon, you see that these individuals, they did not have a salvation experience and then stay there and just say, oh yeah, that was really great, I came to know the Lord and that's it. No, they continuously were cultivating their spiritual life through spiritual disciplines. The danger is when our heart starts to find satisfaction in other things and it starts to care about the things of God, that's when our faith begins to waver. So today, we're gonna to speak about the famous parable of the sower a parable which I'm sure most of us are familiar with in this room. This is the first parable for in the Gospel of Matthew. And in this parable, Jesus, he speaks about four different soils. There's a sower that went out, and he interacts with four different soils. The hard soil, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, and then finally, the good soil. And these different uh, uh, responses, these different soils uh, for the seed, these represent four different responses we could have to the word of God, even this morning. Now, we could look at this parable and say, you know what, I'm a believer, I already follow God, so I know I'm that fourth soil, I'm the good soil. Yeshua's story doesn't really allow us to jump to that conclusion, because there could still be issues in our hearts. So as we're going through it, one of the main questions we should be asking ourselves, kind of like how, how James says that the law is a mirror, it kind of shows you how you're doing with the Lord. As we're going through this, we should question, what's the condition of my heart? Which one does it align with the best? And then what are the dangers going forward? 
So if you would, please pull out your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew 13. I'm not going to have all the passages up here, but I will be going relatively verse by verse. Uh, I'm going to be using the NASB, but whatever version you use, I'm sure it's going to be more or less similar. So that's Matthew 13, 1 through 23. As we go through the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, in our discussion, we're going to look at three main points. The first, the easiest, is the actual story. Jesus sits down and he tells us a nice story, one that's very familiar to the people who are listening to it, the parable of the sower. Next, he gives us the reason for the parables. So he doesn't give us the the interpretation yet. He tells a story and then he explains why he's even giving these parables. Why not just speak in direct speech? Just tell us automatically what we should do or how to understand the scripture. Next, he goes into the reason for the parables, and then finally, he gives the explanation for it, what it actually means. And so those are the three points that we're going to be following this morning. Now, in the midst of this entire discussion, as we go through this chapter, I believe the main point that Yeshua was getting at is that if you want to be the good soil, if you want to be that fourth soil where it's productive and you're producing fruit, we need to be disciplined in cultivating and growing our spiritual lives. We need to be proactive in it. That's the main point. So we'll begin. Now first, uh, just as a quick aside, um, as we're going through this, we're gonna be speaking about Jesus' interaction with the religious leaders. I'm going to use the term religious leaders, which often refers to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders of the religious community. Unfortunately, this type of rhetoric is used in an anti-Semitic fashion um, among, uh, among the general public. And in the past year, we've had two horrendous shootings at synagogues against the Jewish people. And one of the worst things is that when you see the perpetrators, those who engage in the shooting, they claim to follow Jesus. They even had quotations from the Gospel of John on their uh, social media account, right? Nothing could be further from the truth. Matthew was a Jewish author speaking to a Jewish audience about the Jewish Messiah promised in the Jewish scriptures. So when Yeshua, he's speaking with the religious leaders and they're going back and forth, that's what we call intramural, right? It's between the Jewish people. When you read literature around the time of Yeshua, you had other Jewish communities who were writing against other Jews and saying, no, this is how you should follow God. No, this is how. So it's not meant at all to be anti-Semitic. Now, when you actually read Yeshua's critique of the religious leaders, you see the strongest one in Matthew 23. And this is where you see what's really important to the Messiah and what's really important to God. He says in Matthew 23 about the Pharisees and the scribes, do not do according to their deeds. Don't do according to the deeds of the Pharisees, for they say things and they do not do them. One of the most important things for the Messiah was that, is that your outward actions reflect your inward heart that you have integrity, that the heart condition is properly reflected in your actions. And so Matthew 13, again, it's like a mirror for us. It challenges us, how is our heart doing? How is our spiritual life doing? What is the condition of our hearts? Now, the Gospel of Matthew, we've spoken about this before, but it really portrays Yeshua as this new type of Moses. Uh, In the first couple of chapters, it tells you the life of Jesus, how he goes down to Egypt, just like Moses went down to Egypt, and it ends up with Jesus on the, the Sermon on the Mount, just like Moses was on Mount Sinai. He really paints him like a new Moses, a new teacher, but he's so much more. Because after that, Yeshua, he's going around and and he's healing uh, people who are sick. He's taking out demons. He's uh, arguing with the Pharisees about his Messiahship and controlling the sea. And so the people are asking, what kind of person is this that even the winds are obeying him? And so Matthew, as an author, he's bringing us through and he's showing us this is the one we've been waiting for. And then you get to Matthew chapter 12. And in Matthew 12, you have this this demon-possessed person who comes to Yeshua, and this demon-possessed person, he's mute, he can't speak, and he's blind, he can't see, and Yeshua heals him. And the people respond, can this be the son of David? Because in Isaiah 35, in the Hebrew Bible, one of the prophecies about the Messiah is that when he comes in this messianic age, it says that the eyes of the blind will see and the tongue of the mute will sing. So they're seeing the fulfillment right in front of them. And so they're saying, is this the son of David? 
but the religious leaders say no. And so Matthew 12 kind of functions as a shift in the gospel of Matthew. The religious leaders, they say, no, this man cast out his demons according to Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. Essentially, he's, they're saying that the work of God is really the work of Satan, is the work of the enemy, and this marks a turning point in the gospel. So Yeshua, after Matthew 12, he's no longer proclaiming as openly about, you know, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now he really begins to instruct his disciples about how to live in this thing called the kingdom of God. Now in the Hebrew Bible, we know that, that you know, from Isaiah 11, there's going to be the Messiah. He's going to come. That's what I believe. There's going to be a physical return that they're going to reign. He's going to reign physically. There's going to be peace. It's going to be great. We're still looking forward to that. However, today, we're kind of in this, the spiritual characteristics of the kingdom, where we have the circumcision of the heart, you have the Jew and Gentile as the one new man, we have direct relationship with God, but we're still waiting that physical coming. And so Yeshua, he instructs us how to live, how to grow in our spiritual walk, how to live in this kingdom of God today. And that's where we come to Matthew 13, the first time Yeshua uses the parables. So he's instructing us here how to live in the kingdom today. So part one, we have the parable. So let's begin. Now in verse 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 1, sorry, it begins, and I, I do have this verse here. It says, that day Jesus, he went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and the large crowds gathered to him so that he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. So a couple of notes. First, it begins that day. So it's giving us a time frame, putting us in the same time period when the religious leaders rejected the Messiah. So imagine you're sitting there in the first century or you're reading this for the first time and you don't know the ending and Yeshua seems to be fulfilling all of these prophecies except the religious leaders say no. And so you're thinking, well, what now? What's going to happen now? So that day, Jesus, it states that he goes out of a house. Out of the house, you have a narrative right before, verses 46 through 50 in the previous chapter. Right before, you have this really interesting narrative, and everyone has a debate about what it actually means, where Yeshua, he's in a house with the crowds, and he's teaching, and then his disciples come and say, uh, Jesus, your, your mother and your brothers are outside. And then Yeshua says, he, he outstretches his hands and says, Behold, my mother and my brother, those who do the will of my father. And so I think that the purpose of that is to show there's a change in relationship. There's a change in the tides that are going on right now. So that day, Jesus, he goes out of the house. He's sitting by the sea. A large crowd comes to him. And so what does he do? He goes out onto a boat, and Matthew really emphasizes this. Yeshua, he's sitting down on the boat while everybody is standing at the seashore. And that's because in classrooms in the first century, today, you know, when, when we go to a class, you have the students who are sitting and the teacher who is standing. It was a complete opposite in the first century. You would have the teacher who is sitting and the disciples standing around listening. And so here, again, G uh, Matthew is painting this picture of Jesus as the ultimate teacher. And now he's about to go into his parable. And it says, <clears throat> excuse me, it says in verse 3, he spoke many things to them in parables. Many things because there's a string of parables that are going to follow. Now, this is the first time that you run into the word parable in, in Matthew. And there's no reason why we understand that Jesus just jumps into and starts speaking in parables. Now, a parable is not a fable, meaning it's, it's not a story with talking trees or the clouds who, I don't know, begin interacting with each other. A parable is simply an everyday story that has a bigger truth. It's a story you're com uh, completely familiar with that has a, a bigger spiritual truth. They say an earthly story for a heavenly reality or a heavenly truth. We're not really supposed to you know, pick out every little detail of a parable. We're just supposed to understand the main point. So Yeshua, he speaks in parables and it says, Behold, or pay attention, or listen, a sower went out to sow. The one sowing he went out to sow. Now, for us, we're not an agrarian culture here in Montreal, at least I'm not part of one, so it's not quite as familiar to us, but in the first century, this would have been a very common image for the people. It's like me saying to you, behold, a businessman walks into a business meeting. 
right? Behold, a sower goes out to sow. So you have this picture of a person. They have a leather sack on their shoulder. They have seeds in there. And they're taking these seeds, and they're just kind of flailing it everywhere. They're, just, they're not very intentional about where they're putting it. They're just throwing it everywhere. And so it's hitting a whole bunch of different soils. So a sower, he goes out to, see, uh, to, to, um, to sow. And then Jesus starts explaining the different results. As he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. That's the first result. Relatively straightforward. Some of the seeds, they fall into the road. The road is extremely hard because we're walking on it. Animals are walking on it. The dirt gets compressed, so the seeds can't get in. They're laying there. The birds come, and they eat them up. Next, you have the rocky soil. Others fell on the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. So unlike the first example, this one's a little bit better because the seed actually finds soil. But there's an issue. It's too thin. When you, see, when you hear rocky places, don't, don't think, I know I showed you this photo, don't think of this photo really. Think of soil that's laid all across, and you can't really tell what's under it, but almost immediately under it, there's rock. So the soil is very, very shallow. It has nowhere to grow. And the issue here is you really cannot tell how deep the soil is. Uh, and Hannah and I, we were in Hamilton. Um, we wanted to do some, some gardening in the front of our, of our place. And so we started, you know, for whatever reason, the people who lived there before put rocks everywhere, all around the perimeter and inside the dirt. So anytime we would start shoveling, you never really knew whether you were going to hit soil or, you know, you're going to hit that rock and it's going to cause a vibration through the shovel into your arm. You just cannot tell by looking at it. That's the same issue here. It found soil, but it was too uh, shallow. So the seed goes in, the earth, it gets warm, it sprouts, but when the sun comes out, and the sun's supposed to help it, but when it comes out, it kills it because it doesn't have the roots. There's no depth to it. Then we come to our third situation. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them. So in the first one, it's too hard, they can't get in. The second one, they get in for a little bit of soil. The third one, the soil's deep. The issue is not how deep the soil is. The issue is what else is mixed in with the soil. Now you have other plants that are going to function to choke whatever fruits these uh, seeds attempt to produce. So you have these three different scenarios of what happens with the soil being put on these, on the different, uh, with the seeds putting on the different ground. Now up to this point, you could think it's kind of like a horror story for the people listening, right? It's like me saying to you, a businessman went into a business meeting and he invested in three different stocks and they all plummeted, right? It's not a good day. And then Yeshua gives us some hope. You have the fourth uh, soil. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop being the imperfect, they continuously yielded, they continuously produced fruit. Some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Now, usually when you read texts around the time of Yeshua, if it's speaking about the crops, um, if you could produce five to fifteenfold, that's really good. So here, it's kind of like the apex of fruit, like a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. The emphasis isn't really on that. It's they're doing really well. That's the soil you want to be. That's, that's what you want to be doing in producing fruit. So you hear this story, you're sitting there uh, at the seashore, Yeshua tells this story, and you're probably wondering, first, why did Yeshua even start going into parables at all? Why not speak in direct speech? And second, what's the point of that story? You see, there's nothing really unique about the story. It would have been familiar to all the people listening. It's sort of like if I tell you four people wanted to go to college, the first person didn't get in, the second person got in but never enrolled, the third person got in, enrolled, didn't like it, and the fourth person graduated. Okay. You, maybe you know someone in each of those categories, but what's the point? And then Yeshua ends with this statement, he who has ears, let him hear. And what this shows us, this is used elsewhere in Matthew, in Matthew eleven fifteen, 15, for example. And what this shows us is that there's a spiritual significance to this story. In other words, read between the lines. 
if you would. When you, uh, when you read the rebuke of a lot of uh, Old Testament prophets to the people, they often say, and we're going to see an example of this, they often say that you have ears, but you don't hear. You have eyes, but you don't perceive. You're hearing it, but you're not understanding. So Yeshua, he gives a story and he says, you have ears, hear. So we're going to find out what we're supposed to hear. Luckily for us, we have the interpretation of it. But Matthew, being a great writer that he is, they give us a story, but before he gives us the interpretation of the story, he next he goes into the reason for parables. Why did Yeshua even start giving parables at all? Now, I've heard this sermon uh, on Matthew 13 preached before, and people sometimes skip over this part entirely. They just go from the parable to the interpretation of it. However, the reason why Yeshua goes into parables, that's the key. That's the key that makes us think, how am I doing spiritually? That's the key that helps us understand why did the religious leaders reject him? That's the key to prompting us to always be cultivating our spiritual lives. So here in this section, we're going to see the function of the parable, so what it does to people, and then the reason for it, why Yeshua gave it at all. So in verse 10, the disciples, they came to him, and they asked him the question, why do you speak to them in parables? Why did you start using this this form and this method of communication? Now, we know from the Gospel of Mark that at this point, they're all kind of in a room all together. That's often how, when when they speak with Yeshua, they're often alone. That's when he instructs them. And so uh, they're, they're alone, they're not really challenging him, they're just wondering why he's speaking in parables. And this is what he says. To you, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it has not been granted. To you as disciples, as followers of the Messiah, it's been granted to know the mysteries of this kingdom that we're living in, but to those who have not, rege- uh, who have not accepted, it has not been granted. And so, in one sense, the parable functions to reveal to you the truth, but to also conceal it from those who do not follow. Now, we could wonder, we could ask the question, doesn't God want everybody to know? Doesn't God want everyone to follow him? Why on earth would God conceal information from people that to them it's not granted for them to know? Now, here's the key thing. In the Hebrew scriptures and in the New Testament, God is depicted as long-suffering, as patient, as loving, as kind, but he also is a respecter of mankind. He's also a respecter of your wishes, and he gives people over to the desires of their hearts. In Psalm 81, God says, my people did not listen to my voice, Israel did not obey me, so I gave them over to the stubbornness of their hearts. In Romans 1, 18 through 24, when Paul, he's writing to the church in Rome, and he speaks about their their futile minds and how they're futile in their speculations, he says, God therefore gave them over to the lust of their heart in impurity. He eventually will give you over if you want it that much. And the Greek term for give over is often used for slaves. When you would give one slave over to someone else and they would now have the authority over that slave. And so it's sort of like God refraining and taking away his protective hands. In this case, in light of the deliberate rejection of the kingdom of God, now Yeshua moved to parables in order to conceal from those who have rejected But the purpose of the parable is to reveal the kingdom of God, to reveal the reign of God for us today. Often the term secrets, it it kind of excites people. If you ever want to sell a book, just put secrets in your title. As one who studies the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, if you write a book on the secrets of the Dead Sea Scrolls, what they tried to hide from you, something like that, you'll make a lot of money. Uh, The term secrets used often in the Hebrew Bible, and it's, it's... particularly by Daniel and Aramaic, and it's often a revelation that God reveals to us, something we wouldn't be able to know on our own, but the revelation of God allows us to know it. Paul uses it in the New Testament as well about things that were previously unknown. So the purpose of this parable, it shows us the mystery of the kingdom, how to survive in it and how to thrive in it. Because again, we have much of the spiritual reality of the kingdom, the circumcision of the heart, the Jew and Gentile together, and our relationship with God. So that's the function of it, to reveal and to conceal. 
But now Yeshua, he tells us the reason why he started giving it in the first place, these parables. In verse 13, he says, Therefore I speak to them, those who have rejected, I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Now you could ask yourself, how is that possible? How is it possible to hear and not understand, to see and not really perceive? But think of it this way. If you travel to work every day, and it's a routine, and you know the bus route, or you know how to drive there over and over and over, it'll eventually come to the point where you don't even really need to pay that much attention. When I drive, I drive about 15 minutes a couple of times a week, and sometimes I'm just, I mean, I'm careful driving, but you're also not really paying attention to the signs or anything like that. You're sort of on cruise control because you're so familiar with it. You're not really challenging yourself and finding a different route or anything like that. And that's what was the issue with the religious leaders. They thought they were in good standing with God. They thought they were fine, but they didn't see the issue within themselves. Their hearts had grown calloused to God. That was the key to why they rejected his Messiahship. And so Yeshua says in verse 14, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah has been fulfilled. Now, most of us are familiar with this prophecy in Isaiah, in Isaiah 6. Uh, Isaiah, he has his vision, he sees the Lord, there are the seraphim around, everyone singing holy, 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 and he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and so they purify his lips, and, or his tongue, and then God says, who's going to go forward for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me, right? I've, you know, in my religious institutions, uh, we often have these things called missions conferences, where they, people come and try to recruit you to their mission field, and this passage is often preached, right? Be like Isaiah, here I am, send me. They don't often tell you what comes right after that when when Isaiah says, here I am, send me, because then God says, okay, you're going to go forward and they're going to hear you, but they're not going to understand and they're going to see you and they're not going to perceive. In other words, you're not going to be very fruitful on the mission field. Their hearts had grown calloused. And Yeshua was saying, just like it happened there in Isaiah, that's how it is here. He tells us the key in verse 15. For the heart of these people have become numb. Now, the Greek word for dull or for numb, it's often used for thick clouds, something you can't penetrate, something you can't look through. Their heart had come to a point where when you read the word of God, it wasn't really affecting them anymore, where they weren't undergoing the conviction of the spirit, where, you know, on the one hand, Hebrew says that the the word is sharper than a double-edged sword. On the other hand, we could read it and be completely untouched by it. That, that's what was happening with the religious leaders at this point. And then Yeshua, he says at the end of verse 16, or beginning in verse 16, uh, towards the end of the section, he says, but blessed are your eyes as the disciples because you see and your ears because you hear, so that you are separated from them. So in the midst of this explanation, it's important for us to take a step back and think, where would we stand? What what? do our hearts compare to? Is it more like the disciples who do see and do understand? Or is it more like the religious leaders where you're going through the motions, you think you're in good standing, but your heart has become dull to the word. It remains untouched. You see, the key thing with Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, the reason they call the religious leaders mutes and blind and that you can't see is because they're, he's mocking them. He's saying, you guys have become just like your idols. You've become like those things you worship, the things that can't do anything. You've become blind and dumb. And so we could look back, you know, we look back at the story of Exodus where they're worshiping the the golden calf, or we look back at the story of Elijah where Israel is worshiping Baal, and we say, how can they do this? How can they worship somebody else but God? But the key thing is we do the exact same thing today. It just looks different. Timothy Keller, in his book, Counterfeit Gods, he makes the point that all of us have idols in our lives. Idols do not need to be little statues that you worship that represent something else. An idol is anything that you and I give that's more important than God. The blessings of God could become our idols. A spouse could become an idol. Children, jobs, friendships, monetary things, all of this could become idols if we give it a greater position in our lives than God. Timothy Keller says that an idol, when he defines it, it is anything more important to you than God, 
Anything that absorbs your heart, your imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give you. That's what we worship. That's what's up there. That's what drives us in the day. And so the issue with the religious leaders, again, it was not that they didn't believe in God or that they didn't really care for God. They thought they were in good standing. It's just that they upheld other things more important than God, such as their position in society. And that's the key thing of why Yeshua goes into the parable. So we come here for the explanation now. We have the third part where Yeshua explains the meaning of the parable. So as a quick recap, we have the story itself, and then you have the reason for the, for the parables. And the reason was because of the hardness of their hearts. They thought they were in good standing, but they were actually callous to the word, and that's why they rejected. And now we come to the explanation. And the question is, which soil best represents you? So it begins in verses 18 through 19. He begins, hear then the parable of the sower. And I love that because, you know, initially it was, behold, the parable of the sower. Now he says, hear the parable of the sower, because this is the language he was using. They, they hear and they do not understand. They listen, they cannot perceive. And yet now he's saying, hear, be like the spiritually in tune people. Hear the parable of the sower. Understand what it means. And the first one he alludes to is the, uh, the, the hard path. It says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, so the seed represents the, the word of the kingdom, the gospel. When anyone hears it and does not understand it, doesn't have that spiritual perception, the evil one comes and snatches it away, what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom the seed was sown beside the road. So the hard road here represents the calloused heart, represents the heart where nothing could enter in. This is characteristic of the person who is in rebellion against God, who is apathetic to the word, who does not understand it, doesn't have that spiritual inclination to understand what the meaning of the word actually is. And so the question is, how do you develop a hard heart? How do you know if you have a hard heart? Hebrews 3.13 tells us, encourage one another daily while it is still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. The way you get a hard heart is that you allow sin to stay. Now, the, da the danger, you allow sin to stay in your life. The danger is that we could think, uh, a little bit of sin is not a big deal. See, Paul says a little bit of leaven, a little bit of sin ruins the whole lump of dough. A little bit of sin that we carry in our lives, that's going to grow and grow and grow unless you're getting rid of it. It's sort of like if you know the, the common story of the, uh, the frog in the pot in the hot water, right? If you take a frog and you put him in boiling water, he's going to jump right out without a doubt. However, if you put a frog in water and slowly, 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 it gets warmer, 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 and they hardly notice it before they know it, it's too late. And so the calloused heart here is the one that has harbored sin and has allowed it to stay in their lives, thinking it's no big deal. And then Matthew says, in this scenario, um, the evil one, he comes and he snatches the word away, meaning he takes it away by force. He takes it out so it doesn't have the opportunity to do any work in softening it. If anyone is familiar with the screw tape letters, if anyone has read that book, if you have not, I encourage you to do so. The screw tape letters was written by C.S. Lewis. And in the screw tape letters, it's fictional. It's a bunch of one-way letters written by an uncle demon to his nephew. And his nephew was kind of new on the job. He's, he's learning the ropes of how to like uh, trip up believers and things like that. And so this uncle demon is just instructing him on how to get the person distracted or how to do this or that. And this is what he says. He says, it's funny how mortals, like humans, uh, believers, it's funny how mortals always picture us putting things into their minds. In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. So you see, as you're reading the word, it's not going to do much good if, if Satan says to you, yeah, but you love sin, or you know, like, no, let's wrestle with this. There's probably some issue with this. The best work is to make you distracted and to keep it out entirely. So as you're reading the word, do you have enough milk in the fridge? Did so-and-so email you back about that important document? Are you ready for your business meeting on Monday? Ah, oh, that's how you snatch it out. So the calloused heart, the hard heart, that's the first one. It's not, nothing is able to penetrate through it. The case number two, you have the rocky soil. 
And it says in Matthew, the one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Great news, they're happy. Yet he has no firm root in himself but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. The best way to understand this rocky soil is to know that it's the shallow heart. It's the shallow heart, the one that never put in the study or the disciplines in order to grow their faith. Unfortunately, you have uh, probably the, the more popular version of Christianity is that if you come to know the Lord, you're going to be happy and you're going to be blessed and you're going to receive material things and you know God will kind of be like a piggy bank for you. And boy, what a drastic change from the first century when all the disciples, apart from John, as far as we know, gave their lives for their belief and were persecuted from it. Matthew says that following the Messiah is a narrow road. It's difficult that there's going to be persecution. And so one way I like to think about it You know, we say that if we're believers, we want to be like Yeshua. We want to act like Yeshua did. The people rejected Yeshua. They completely rejected him. And so what do we think they're going to do with us if we walk in Yeshua's way? That's the cost of discipleship. And yet this person here, he receives the word. He's happy for it. And yet when persecution comes, and persecution could work to grow your faith, but when it comes here, he did not have the roots He had a shallow faith because he didn't cultivate his spiritual life. Outward pressure made them break. There was no serious study or continual deepening of his or her faith. And so they fell away, meaning they stumbled into their faith, and they were no longer following. That's case number two. Case number three, you have the thorny uh, soil. This is the one that other things are mixed in. So unlike the previous example where it's a shallow faith and persecution comes, here the issue is inward. The issue is with the heart. It states, the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, but the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So it's nothing outside, but it's what's in the heart that's making him or her uh, not be fruitful. So this person, they hear the word, and there are two issues. The worries of this age, which Yeshua speaks about a lot in the Sermon on the Mount, and the seduction of wealth. Now, both of these things, if you worry about what's going to happen, what am I going to eat, what job am I going to have, as well as wealth, I'm going to pursue after these things. This is going to give me my freedom. Both of those things are idols. Both of those things show us that you're not trusting in God's providence and God taking care. And so the person, while they are saying that they believe in God, while they may be reading, while the soil may be deep, they have other idols in their lives, and they could be compared to the one called double-minded in James. In James 1.8, which, we're, uh, which you're going through at Beth Ariel in James, it says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Double-minded in Greek is literally double-souled. You have two different affiliations. And so in Deuteronomy 6, what does God say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Here you're loving two different things, and that's going to choke all the possible fruit out. And so case one, you have the calloused heart, the one that has sin. Then in case number two, you have the shallow heart, the one that never cultivated or grew in their spiritual walk. And then case number three, we have the double-minded person, the one who has allegiances, yes, to God, but to other things. None of these are going to be able to produce the fruit that it could. And then we get to soil number four, the good soil, the good heart, the one that we want. In case 4, verse 23, it says, But the one sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word. Right. So this is the contrast. In Matthew 13, he says that there are those who hear but they don't understand. This one hears and understands, has a spiritual perception. They understand the word. And so they're able to produce, uh, bear fruit, and it yields some 100, some 60, some 30 times what is initially sown. And the question is, what is the good soil? If you want to be good soil, what do you need to do? What's the magic formula? And funny enough, there's no description of the good soil that Matthew gives us here. But what we could assume is that the good soil is lacking all of the issues the other soils have. So if we want to be the good soil, 
what we need to do is first, not harbor sin. Meaning that when we have sin in our lives, when we're convicted by the Spirit, or when something just seems off, we address it right away. We don't look to, well, yeah, but that person doesn't, and so that's okay. Or I've been doing it for so long, and I think I'm fine the way that it is. We address the sin right away. We get rid of it. We don't harbor sin. Otherwise, it's going to grow and make our hearts callous. The second thing is that it cultivates the faith, meaning that we don't just come on Saturday morning or Sunday morning and just expect to be fed and then that's it, but we're pursuing the character of God through, the, through study and through prayer. Otherwise, you have the shallow faith that when the persecution comes, we won't be able to hold on to to anything. And then finally, you have the full allegiance to God. What else is more important? In our minds, in our hearts, we could have a tremendous list of things, but God should always be at the center of our priorities. Of course, God has given us responsibilities, given us responsibilities with a job, given us responsibilities with a spouse or with children or things like that, and you have to take those well and do them as a good worker. But the question is, what is our priority? What is our ultimate goal? And if we have a split allegiance, that's going to prevent true fruitfulness. fruitfulness. So the good soil here does not harbor sin. It cultivates faith, and there is a full allegiance to God. So in conclusion, what we've seen here, the religious leaders, they rejected the kingdom of the Messiah, and we could say, how on earth could they reject the kingdom of the Messiah? He tells us, because of the callousness of their heart. And so the parable of the sower shows us, listen, you may proclaim to follow God, you may even have the, the seed, the word of God being brought into you, but it's really the status of your heart that's going to determine how fruitful you are in the kingdom today. If we want to be true disciples of the Messiah, we thrive for the good soil. The purpose of the parable is to teach the four main ways that people will respond to the kingdom. And so the question is, which one best represents us now? Of course, we could have numerous applications, uh, numerous things to take away from this, uh, this simple yet provocative story. But my question is, do we have idols? Are we on cruise control? Do we allow other things to take priority in our lives apart from God? And one of the key ways to figure out if we do is to compare ourselves with what God expects from us. I challenge you, Read through Matthew with the question in mind, what does Jesus expect from his disciples? And see if that, if that aligns with us. You know, growing up, I, I remember I took some um, eye exams when I was a, a kid. I was maybe 11, 12, 13, and I went to, uh, to take my eye uh, tested, and they said, I don't need glasses, and that, that I'm fine. I have perfect vision, and I thought, wonderful, I have perfect vision. And then about seven years later, I, I was married to my wife, Hannah, who has glasses. She has 20-20 vision, and we were driving in the Adirondacks, and we were quite bored because the scenery is beautiful, but there wasn't a lot else to see. And so we started playing a game of who could read the sign first when the sign was coming up. And as I was starting to differentiate between the green and the white colors on the sign, she was able to read it. And that's when I realized I don't have good vision. I was told I had good vision, I thought I had good vision, only when I compared it to perfect vision did I realize how far short I fell. And in the same way, we may think we're doing well spiritually, but it's very important to keep this mirror up before us to see how our hearts are actually doing. And so my prayer for all of us, like King David, when he sinned, he asked the Lord, God, create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story of the parable of the sowers. We thank you, Lord, for the truth of the importance, what we put into our lives and how we cultivate our spiritual lives, Lord. I pray for the conviction and the power of the Holy Spirit over all of us, Lord, that we will not be able to be satisfied with the status we are in, that we will not be able to be satisfied with the sin that we are harboring, God, but make us have sleepless nights over these things, Father, that we need to address them, we need to come face to face with them, Father, and we need to have a clean heart before you. Father, alongside David, I pray for all of us that you create a clean heart within us, Lord, that we would be more effective in your kingdom. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen.